Bible study will focus on the era of Reconstruction of 1865 to 1877. The War's Aftermath Because the Constitution did not deal with the issue of secessionism, it did not address the issue of how a state may re-enter the Union or who was responsible for reconstructing the South. Who should decide Reconstruction, the President or the Congress? Should Confederate leaders be tried for treason or should they be pardoned? What should be the process by which Southern representatives could reclaim their seats in Congress? How will the Southern economy be rebuilt? The Civil War devastated the South's economy. The Union Army had destroyed nearly everything. One fourth of Southern white men between the ages of 20 and 40 had died in the war. Four million newly African Americans were homeless and unemployed. Another question to ask was what rights will African Americans have? The 13th Amendment, the Republican Party supported programs to extend full citizenship to African Americans. White Southerners, of course, opposed the idea. The time period the South would now enter is known as Reconstruction. And in any, many instances, the Civil War is a final blow to the industrial agrarian conflict that for so long had divided the North and the South. How the North and its industrial might had gained control of Congress would no longer be at the mercy of the South. The South now had to rebuild its society to conform to the victorious Union's demands. The Emancipation Proclamation had abolished slavery in the South and had freed over $4 billion worth of slaves. The South had to rebuild, but its railroads, its lands, and its manpower had been severely decimated by the war. What money was still available was inadequate to meet the needs of the devastated South or the former slaves. The Union victory in the war profoundly impacted the lives of both the defeated Confederates and the freed slaves in a variety of ways. Individuals from both groups had to adjust to a new normal. We often viewed each other with prejudice and distrust, informed by many years in which slavery had been established as part of Southern life. The Confederate Army was beaten, but in many areas, the Southern people were still unbowed. Many planters now found themselves destitute as they were unable to manage their lands without their slaves. As the Union soldiers were dispatched to take control of the former rebel provinces, they were viewed with hatred as the conquerors they were. Although former slaves found themselves freed from slavery, very few Northerners were willing to elevate the freedmen to the same status as whites. Former slaves wanted to reunite with their families and to gain the education and skills that they would need to become self-reliant. Many argued that land should be provided for them to work, but nothing came of this plan. Debates over political reconstruction, Lincoln's 10% plan. In 1863, Lincoln issued his plan to return the rebels to the Union. Former Confederate states could be reestablished and accepted as legitimate by the president as soon as those 10% of the voters, who last voted in 1860, and that state took a loyalty oath. Presidential pardons can be granted to most Southerners and ex-Confederates who took an oath of allegiance to the Union and the United States Constitution and accepted emancipation of slaves. State governments must include the 13th Amendment in their new state constitutions and provide education for African Americans. Then the state can regain representation in Congress and would be allowed to return to the Union as a reconstructed state. Compensation for damaged property would also be included in the plan. This plan was viewed by Congress as being too lenient to the rebels. When Tennessee, Arkansas, and Louisiana met these guidelines, Congress refused to accept them, stating that Reconstruction was a legislative, not an executive function. The Congressional Beliefs The radical Republicans believed that the South should be more severely punished for bringing the war to the nation and should be made to pay war cost. While the majority in Congress agreed with Lincoln that mass executions for treason were not in order, they did not want key uh, 
political or military leaders to emerge as leaders of post-war South. A minority wanted different change. The Wade Davis bill, led by Senator Benjamin Wade of Ohio and Representative Henry Davis, passed a much harsher plan of reconstruction, which called for even more stringent demands on the South, including an oath of allegiance by 50% of the male citizens of the state, while exempting most ex-Confederates from participation. State governments had to repudiate Confederate debts and prohibit slavery. Although the bill was passed by Congress, it was within two weeks of adjournment and was therefore pocket vetoed. A bill not signed in 10 days is automatically vetoed by Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln understood his veto could not be overridden. In addition, the Wade Davis Manifesto was issued, which accused Lincoln of violating his constitutional authority. Lincoln and the radical Republicans in Congress disagreed over which branch of government should lead Reconstruction and what form it should take. They agreed, however, that it needed to happen and that a part of Reconstruction must include a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery and provide assistance to former slaves. The 13th Amendment was proposed on December 14, 1863 to abolish slavery by Representative James Mitchell Ashley, a Republican of Ohio. In the Senate debate and vote on April 8, 1864, the Senate took the first crucial step towards the constitutional abolition of slavery. Before a packed gallery, a strong coalition of 30 Republicans, four border state Democrats, and four Union Democrats joined forces to pass the amendment 38 to 6. And the House debate and vote on June 15th of the same year, it failed to pass the amendment with 93 in favor and 65 against, 13 votes short of the two-thirds vote needed for passage. The vote split largely along party lines, with Republicans supporting and Democrats opposing. President Lincoln had concerns that the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 might be reversed or found invalid by the judiciary after the war. He saw a constitutional amendment as a more permanent solution, since it would be debated. During a lame duck session of Congress, in which many members of Congress had already seen their successors elected, most would be concerned about unemployment and lack of income, and none needed to fear the electoral consequences of cooperation. It finally passed the House on January 31st, 1865, 119 in favor, 84 Republicans and 14 Democrats, and 18 Independents, versus 56 against. 50 Democrats and six independents and 44 decided not to vote. The amendment was ratified by the required number of states on December 6, 1865. And on December 18, 1865, Secretary of State William H. Seward proclaimed its adoption. In order to help the freedmen adopt to their new lives, Congress created the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865, which aimed to provide them with the basic necessities as they adjusted. Whereas other federal efforts had focused on states, the Freedmen's Bureau focused on direct aid to individuals, specifically former slaves. The Freedmen's Bureau never fulfilled all its goals, but its leader, General Oliver O. Howard, and many of its members did their best to help former slaves negotiate labor contracts, reunite with their families, and legalize their marriages, in addition to providing direct aid in the form of medical care, food, clothing, and schools. The Bureau's greatest success was in education. General Howard helped to establish nearly 3,000 schools for freed blacks, including several black colleges, before federal funding it was stopped in 1870. The Bureau of Schools taught an estimated 200,000 African Americans how to read. Major Martin Delaney, a black abolitionist from the North and the highest ranking officer in the United States Colored Troops, provides an example of one of the many freed African Americans who sought to help empower and educate the newly freed blacks in the South. Their talk of self-reliance and education frightened white Southerners who had owned slaves and who for years had feared slave rebellion. Whereas Delaney and others saw the promise of equality and citizenship and of economic self-sufficiency for former slaves, these white Southerners viewed such talk as bringing their own economic, political, 
and social ruin. Death of a President Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, a Southern sympathizer, on April 14, 1865. Other members of Lincoln's cabinet, specifically Secretary of State Seward and Vice President Johnson, were targeted but escaped without the loss of life. Booth was shot when they were trying to recapture him, and the other conspirators, four of them, were convicted and hanged. With Lincoln's death, the potential for a more lenient reconstruction became much less likely. Lincoln wanted a peace with malice towards none and charity for all. Vice President Andrew Johnson became president following Lincoln's death. Johnson's plan. First, let's look at the background of Andrew Johnson. He was a self-taught tailor and rose to Tennessee politics by championing the interest of poor whites and their economic conflict with rich planters. Johnson was the only senator from a Confederate state who remained loyal to the Union, and for his loyalty, he's going to be chosen in the 1864 election as Lincoln's running mate in order to encourage pro-Union Democrats to vote for the Union Party, which was really the Republican Party. Lincoln's assassination changed the face of Reconstruction. Johnson became the wrong man for the job. As a white supremacist, he was not strong enough to counteract the demands of radical Republicans in Congress, who believed that the war was fought not just to preserve the Union, but also to liberate blacks from slavery. Johnson's Reconstruction policy, at first, many Republicans welcomed Johnson as president, thinking, this is going to be our guy because his apparent hatred for the Southern Democrats who led the Confederacy. However, Johnson's Reconstruction Plan was very similar to Lincoln's 10% plan, and it provided for the disenfranchisement or loss of the right to vote and hold office of all former leaders and office holders of the Confederacy, and Confederates with more than $20,000 in taxable property. However, the president retained the power to grant individual pardons to disloyal Southerners. This was an escape clause for the wealthy planters, and Johnson made frequent use of it. As a result of the presidential pardons, many former Confederate leaders were back in office by the fall of 1865. In addition to Lincoln's plan made by Johnson was that every state must adopt the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, to regain its full rights. Once they were allowed to send representatives representatives, the South returned many Confederates to Congress, angering the Republicans who demanded reform-minded legislatures. Many Southern states had enacted black codes designated to limit African Americans in their new freedom. Freedmen's Conventions Former slaves in the South recognized that the federal government and its officials were making decisions based on what they thought freedmen needed or wanted without asking them directly. African Americans began organizing themselves into freedmen's conventions, sometimes called equal rights associations. They sometimes included African Americans from the North, and their leaders were often ministers. These conventions argued for citizenship, full civil rights, land for former slaves, suffrage, free public education, and other rights of citizens. State conventions, meanwhile, remained open to whites only. Freedmen conventions demanded their voices to be heard and emphasized their importance to Reconstruction. The actions of the South following the Civil War swelled the ranks of the Radical Republicans as moderates flocked to their camp. Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania and Charles Sumner of Massachusetts led the Radical Republicans in Congress. Sumner was the senator who had been beaten with a cane by Preston Brooks in the 1850s. They argued that Johnson's plan was politically motivated and would undermine the necessary changes for the country to become fully united once again. In addition, they wanted to change the Southern system of government, transform the Southern economy, and provide social and political equality for African Americans. The Fall Elections of 1865 Many former Confederates viewed these plans with distrust and bitterly opposed any Republican efforts to reform the southern states. Instead, they attempted to form governments similar to those they had previously had. The southern states did draw up constitutions that repudiated secession, negated the debts of the Confederate government, and ratified the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. However, the new constitution did not extend voting rights to blacks. 
The election results of the fall elections of 1865, when Congress reconvened in December, all southern states had accepted the president's requirement, except Mississippi, sending an all-white delegation to Congress for roll call, including former Confederate official uh, to office Alexander Stevens, who was the ex-Confederate vice president, now as senator of Georgia. Radical Republicans refused to see them and created a joint committee on Reconstruction aimed towards developing a new plan to reconstruct the South. The Joint Committee quickly realized how widespread white violence directed towards African Americans and former Union soldiers was. In June of 19, 1866, a Joint Committee of the House and Senate issued a report recommending that reorganizing former states of the Confederacy were not entitled to representation in Congress. Therefore, those elected from the South as senators and representatives should not be permitted to take their seats. The report further asserted that Congress, not the President, had the authority to determine the conditions for allowing reconstructed states to rejoin the Union. By this report, Congress officially rejected the presidential plan for reconstruction and promised to substitute its own plan, part which enabled the 14th Amendment. What also angered them was the new Black Codes. These restrictive codes that Southern all-white legislatures had passed in 1865 through 1866 had led to African-American protests. These laws were meant to keep African-Americans in a state of nominal freedom and little economic, social, or political power and keep them as landless workers, servants, and farm laborers. Crimes were insulting language and they were not allowed jury duty, no suffrage. Republicans in Northern took offense to the Black Codes as they saw another name for slavery, and the election of those led to their states out of the Union. The moderate Republicans now began to side with the Repu radical Republicans, three to one, in an advantage over the Democrats. The battle over Reconstruction consumed all of 1865. By the time it ended, the radical Republicans had found themselves in the majority in Congress, but fell short of the two-thirds vote necessary to override a presidential veto. Johnson used a veto to kill an extension of the Freedmen's Bureau in 1866, stated that it violated the Constitution. In March of that same year, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which Johnson vetoed as well as he objected to the measure because it conferred citizenship on the freedmen at a time when 11 out of 36 states were unrepresentative in the Congress and that it discriminated in favor of African Americans against the whites. However, because of his actions, Johnson had alienated more Republicans, and his veto was overridden by one vote. Republicans then feared, however, the law could be repealed by the Democrats ever won control of the Congress. They therefore looked for a more permanent solution in the form of a constitutional amendment. The 14th Amendment defined citizenship added to the Constitution as a way to ensure that none of it could be declared unconstitutional or removed by a later law, Congress proposed an amendment which stated that all persons born in the United States or naturalized a U.S. citizen could not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. It further stated that any state that limited the voting rights of a segment of its population might have their congressional representatives reduced. Former Confederate officials were banned from holding elective office without a two-third congressional pardon. Confederate war debts were repudiated. Fighting for the 14th, Johnson's opposition to this further alienated congressional moderates, African-American representatives. If Southerners refused African-American males from voting, they would reduce their numbers in Congress. The American Equal Rights Association, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, stated all should be equal and lobbied against it, and also den denied leading Confederate officials from holding office or state offices. In the House vote, 120 Republicans voted yay, 32 Democrats voted nay, 19 did not vote. In the Senate vote, 33 voted yay. 11 nay. All 33 were Republicans. Voting nay were three 
Demo three Republicans and six Democrats, and two independents. Not voting were five. Ratification. Tennessee was the first Southern state to approve of the 14th Amendment. Other Southern states followed Johnson's lead and refused. This refusal led to the passage of the Reconstruction Acts, ignoring the existing state governments. Military government was imposed until new civil governments were established and the 14th Amendment was ratified. It also prompted Congress to pass a law on March 2, 1867, requiring that a former Confederate state must ratify the 14th Amendment before, quote, said state shall be declared entitled to representation in Congress, end quote. The 14th Amendment was ratified on July 20th, 1868. Reconstruction Acts of 1867. The first Reconstruction Act was passed on March 2nd, 1867. Except for Tennessee, who had accepted the 14th Amendment in 1866, the rest of the Confederacy was divided into five military districts, each governed by a major general appointed by the president, empowered to bring offenders to trial and to punish them in order to maintain order. In the new state constitutional conventions, each state was to call new constitutional conventions, elected by all adult males, excluding ex-Confederates. When at first Southerners refused to call such conventions, the military was empowered to register voters for the election of delegates to the constitutional conventions. This was the second act of March of 1867. Congress had required most registered voters to approve the new constitutions, the third act of 1868. But after Southerners refused to vote, it was amended to require only a majority of those who voted. Readmission to the Union. New state constitutions had to guarantee the vote to African Americans and to prevent ex-Confederates from voting who did not obtain a congressional pardon. If Congress approved the Constitution, the state legislature had to approve the 14th Amendment before final readmission. Seven states were readmitted by 1870, with federal troops still remaining in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. Additional Congressional Acts Command of the Army Act, made into law on 2nd March 1867. To ensure that President Johnson did not interfere with the major generals in each military district, all military orders from the president must go through the general of the army, who was Ulysses S. Grant at this time. The president, although commander-in-chief, was forbidden from dealing directly with the military governors in the South. The Tenure of Office Act passed in March of 1867. The president was further prohibited from removing any official from office who had been approved by Congress without congressional approval. The end of Johnson's presidency. The impeachment and trial of Johnson. Johnson and his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, who had been appointed by Lincoln, did not get along. Stanton consistently sided with congressional radical Republicans, agreeing that military governors were answerable to the commander of the army and then to the House of Representatives, not the President of the United States. Believing that the Tenure of Office Act was unconstitutional in 1867, Johnson removed Stanton from that position and tried to appoint Ulysses S. Grant, but it failed by a vote of 35 to 7. The radical Republicans used these as an excuse of removing Stanton and impeached Johnson on the grounds that he had violated the Tenure of Office Act. He was impeached and then went to trial. The Senate trial lasted from March 5th to May 26th, Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase presiding. The Senate voted 35 to 19 to remove the president. Only seven Republicans and 12 Democrats voted against removal. Therefore, it failed by one vote to convict and remove Johnson. The siding vote was cast by Republican Senator Edmund G. Ross of Kansas, which ruined his political career. Ross said the whole thing was political in nature. Johnson sought the Democratic nomination in 1868 for his own term as president, but never received it, and Grant would win the election as Republican. The Election of 1868 Republicans in Chicago nominated the Civil War hero Ulysses S. Grant of Ohio for president on the first ballot 
and radical Republican Schuler Colfax of Indiana for vice president. Democrats in New York nominated ex-Governor Horatio Seymour for president and Unionist Francis Blair of Kentucky for vice president. During the campaign, Republicans again waved the bloody shirt. Benjamin Butler of Massachusetts, the one who came up with the idea. The Ku Klux Klan ran a terror, murdering hundreds of Southern Republicans, and campaigned on a platform which called for radical reconstruction, condemned the actions of President Johnson. And Democrats advocated paying the national debt in gold, but did not fully endorse the tariff or black suffrage. Democrats attacked radical reconstruction and endorsed paying the national debt in greenbacks. The results? Grant carried 26 of 34 states, receiving th about 3 million popular votes and 214 electoral votes to Seymour's 2.7 million votes and 80 electoral votes. The significance, as radical Republicans had hoped, Grant's 309,000 vote plurality was provided by over half a million African Americans who voted for the first time, and mostly voted Republican, which provided a two-party system for the South. The 15th Amendment. Radical Republicans passed the 15th Amendment that guaranteed the federal level of the right of citizens to vote regardless of race, color, or previous condition or servitude. But former slaves have been registering to vote and voting in large numbers in some state elections since 1867. The House of Representatives passed the amendment with 143 Republicans and one conservative Republican vote of yay. Voting nay were 39 Democrats, three Republicans, and one independent Republican and one conservative. Not voting were 26 Republicans, eight Democrats, and one independent Republican. The Senate passed the amendment with a vote of 39 Republican votes of yay. Voting nay were eight Democrats and five Republicans. Not voting were 20 Republicans and four Democrats. Some radical Republicans, as, such as Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, abstained from voting because the amendment did not prohibit literacy tests and poll taxes. States could still require literacy or property qualifications to vote, which affected many blacks. In April and December of 1869, Congress passed Reconstruction bills mandating that Virginia, Mississippi, Texas, and Georgia ratify the amendment as a precondition to regaining congressional representation. All four states did so. The struggle for ratification was particularly close in Indiana and Ohio, which voted to ratify in May of 1869 and January of 1870, respectively. New York, which had ratified on April 14, 1869, tried to revoke its ratification on January 5, 1870. However, in February of 1870, Georgia, Iowa, Nebraska, and Texas ratified the amendment, bringing the total ratifying states to 29, one more than required 28 from the 37 states, and forestalling any court challenge to New York's resolution to withdraw its consent. Women's suffrage fought to have the word sex put into the language instead of male, led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. By the end of 1870, all the former Confederate states had met the conditions for being readmitted, including ratifying the 15th Amendment, which gave all men the right to vote. The one thing that's interesting of all three amendments, especially in the 14th and 15th Amendment, no Democrat voted to pass the amendment. Black life under Reconstruction. Freed but not equal. Despite the promises of Reconstruction, the freedmen did not receive equality now that they were no longer bound to their masters. In some ways, their situation was worse. <clears throat> African-American military veterans made up most of the African-American political leaders in the South during Reconstruction. Their military experience had opened up opportunities for education, training, and leadership. White Southerners, who tended to fear these rising leaders, used terror to attempt to intimidate them and other African Americans. Black churches and schools. On the eve of its move to a new building, the first African Church of Richmond, Virginia, was featured in a short article, including illustrations such as the one above in Harper's Weekly in June of 1874. The church became the center of the Freedmen's Society, 
as by 1890, over 13% of African Americans in the South proclaimed themselves to be Baptists due to that denomination's decentralized structure. Marriage, which under slavery had been illegal, exploded with the majority of former slave families living in two-parent homes by 1870. Communities also worked to establish schools to educate the freedmen. This effort faced pressure from the whites in the South who feared that educating them would cause them to seek better social and economic opportunities elsewhere. The first schools were established by the Freedmen's Bureau and female teachers from New England. Politics and African Americans. Blanche K. Bruce left and Hiram Revels Wright served in the U.S. Senate. Frederick Douglass as the center was a major figure in the abolitionist movement. The constitutional conventions demanded of the states by Congress were populated by several hundred freedmen. Between 1870 and 1877, African-American leaders included Senators Hiram Revels and Blanche K. Bruce, both Mississippi natives who had been educated in the North, and 14 black congressmen in the House of Representatives. At the state level, African-Americans served as representatives in the state legislatures, six as lieutenant governors two as speakers of the House in Mississippi and South Carolina briefly, held a majority in one house, was African-American. On the county and city level, they served as school superintendents, sheriffs, mayors, coroners, and police chiefs. African-Americans and property, land, labor, and disappointment. A power struggle between rural and urban freedmen developed over issues pertaining to the redistribution of land, and many urban African-American leaders argued against the leveling of the social classes to allow the uneducated to be on par with the educated in society. Many former slaves, however, argued that they needed land to be able to become self-efficient. They pointed out that they had tilled and worked the land for years as slaves, and that they should be given land taken from Confederate leaders, a prospect that horrified many white Southerners. Lacking the funds to buy their own land, many former slaves and poor whites became sharecroppers. Sharecroppers rented land, seed, and tools in exchange for a share of the crop after harvest. The strict limits of these agreements and the precariousness of agriculture often led to cycles of poverty. Tension among Southern Blacks. Although the post-war South is often portrayed as an area of conflict between former slaves and, for, and former Confederate soldiers, the reality was more complicated. Tensions among Southern Blacks themselves are important to consider as well. Individual African Americans had their own opinions on Reconstruction and how it should look. Their communities were often split between those who had more education and social and political power and those without, especially those without land. In addition, a number of white Republican Southerners favored the re radical Republican plan for Reconstruction, seeing in it an opportunity for themselves in a region that had long been dominated by a small, wealthy, elite group of planters. Carpetbaggers and scatterwags. During Reconstruction, any person who was held a role in aiding the Confederacy was barred from holding a position in government. Therefore, those who held position were of two categories. Southerners who betrayed the roots and sided with the Union during the war were known as scalawags, or Northerners who immigrated to the South called carpetbaggers. For carpetbaggers, Northerners coming down to take advantage of the South's misfortune to take a position Southerners could not hold. For scalawags, Southern white unionists who were kept out of the political process before the war joined the Republican Party. Southern unionists desiring retaliation against the wartime persecutors. Poor white yeoman farmers desiring a share of the large plantation. Southern businessmen hoping that the economic policies of the Republicans would rejuvenate Southern industry and economy. And upper class Southerners, former Whigs, who desired to control the African American voters and a rise to power over their former enemies, the Democrats. Southern Resistance and Reconstruction's Legacies. This Thomas Ness cartoon condemns the Ku Klux Klan for promoting conditions worse than slavery for Southern blacks after the Civil War. 
With each passing year, Southern whites used terror, intimidation, and violence to prevent blacks from exercising their political rights and take control from Republican rule. The Ku Klux Klan began as a social club, but quickly became a terrorist group that targeted African Americans, white Republicans, and former Union soldiers. Many of the constitutions that were forced on the South during Reconstruction remained after that era ended, and many of the provisions found therein would be adopted into new ones. Important infrastructure projects, such as rebuilding of railroads, came out of Reconstruction, and the radicals also gave more attention to the poor and to orphanages, asylums, and institutions for the deaf blind of both races. However, government officials were not immune to corrupt practices. Bribes and kickbacks were common, and state governments awarded money to corporations through shady deals. The Grant Administration Following the war, the United States had 432 million worth of greenbacks that were to be paid back with hard money. Once done, paper money was abolished and a return to specie occurred. Democrats advocated printing more to pay off the debt. This was known as the Ohio Idea. Although he had never elected office before, Grant was elected President of the United States in 1868, based mainly on his victory in the Civil War. He was the youngest president up to that time and was often blind to the forces of political office and awestruck by the wealth of some of his supporters. The 15th Amendment had officially guaranteed voting rights to African Americans, despite its early promise, however, Southern white leaders found ways to restrict African American suffrage by introducing poll taxes, cumbersome voting registration procedures, and other ways to undermine black voting rights. The Naturalization Act of 1870 demonstrated the complexity of racial identity and citizenship when it officially extended the right of naturalization to aliens of African nativity and to persons of African descent, but excluded Asian immigrants and Native Americans from the process. The Union Leagues were organized by Republicans in former Confederate states to recruit black voters to join the Republican Party. These groups were similar to fraternities due to their rituals and their encouragement of black Republicans worried white Democrats. Although black Republicans could, at times, be coerced in their techniques as Southern white Democrats wore, they also helped elect black men to office throughout the former Confederate states and increased the enfranchisement of black male voters. The Indian Wars in the West had continued even during the Civil War. Grant appointed General Eli Parker, pictured to the left, a Seneca chief as a Commissioner of Indian Affairs in 1869, marking the first time that a Native American led the department that was formed to deal with U.S. Native American relations. Grant and Parker attempted to create a new policies and opportunities for many Native Americans in the nation and to limit the corruption that had plagued the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Grant soon realized, however, that these efforts would only go so far. Abolitionist Wendell Phillips, for example, confronted the the racial prejudice that undermined the opportunities for both African Americans and Native Americans in the United States. Scandals consistently plagued Grant during his presidency. The Black Friday scandal. Wall Street financiers Jay Gould and James Fisk, with the help of Grant's brother-in-law, tried to corner the gold market. It was broken up by the Treasury Department, but gold still made a huge profit. The whiskey ring. Corrupt government officials and whiskey makers steal millions of dollars in national tax revenue scam. The trading post frame. Secretary of War William Belknap allegedly took extortion money from trading contractors at Fort Sill. The primary investigator and contributor to many of these scandals was Grant's personal secretary, Oliver E. Babcock, who indirectly controlled many cabinet departments and was able to lay investigations by reformers. Babcock had directed access to Grant at the White House and had tremendous influence over who could see the president. His own vice president, Schulfer Colfax, was investigated and implicated in a scheme to steal profits from the Union Pacific Railroad. Grant seemed to look the other way when scandal was revealed. He pardoned those who were found guilty and served jail time. 
The heavy-handedness of radical Republicans and the scandals of the Grant administration has spawned the creation by 1872 of a new faction in the Republican Party, that of liberal Republicans. Liberal Republicans wanted the party to focus more on free trade and the economy instead of combating racism and upholding the rights of African Americans. Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871, Congress too wanted to leave Reconstruction behind and Southern Republicans begged for federal protection. In the Deep South, the Ku Klux Klan played an instrumental role in determining the outcome of elections. As events outside the South drew the attention of Northerners away from the area, the freedmen found themselves drifting away from their civil rights. Republican control of the former Confederacy dwindled as Democrats began to reclaim their office and their governments. Congress responded with the Enforcement Acts in 1870 and 1871, which made it a federal offense to interfere with the right to vote. Violence was not limited in the South. Incidents occurred against African Americans in the North as well. And the Amnesty Act of 1872 removed the last restrictions on ex-Confederates except for top leaders. Now, Southerners began to vote for Democrats to take control of state governments. In the election of 1872, Grant wins despite the scandals. Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, was the Democratic nominee, but in less than three months, he lost his wife on October 30th, the election November 4th, his money and his mind in his life on November 29th, and was the only presidential candidate in a major party to receive no electoral votes. Three were pledged out of the 66, but Congress refused to count them. The economy under Grant. The withdrawal of greenbacks from circulation, the overextension of railway lines beyond profitable means, and the failure of Jay Cook's bank caused a loss of confidence in the economy and started a panic. The depression that followed lasted six years. The Republicans, being the party in power, took the blame for the depression. And in 1874, the Democrats took control of the House of Representatives. At the time, some greenbacks were still in circulation and were traded lower than gold. But when Grant demanded that greenbacks be redeemed for the same value of gold, parity shook the economy and the Depression continued. The Supreme Court The Supreme Court's decision in the Slaughterhouse Cases of 1873 provided the opportunity for states to discriminate against African Americans or other Americans. The ruling limited the privileges or immunities that all U.S. citizens were supposed to have and been guaranteed by the 14th Amendment to issues of U.S. citizenship only, not that of the states. The case originally dealt with monopolies in the livestock and slaughtering business, but states expanded the ruling to other rights as well. In the United States versus Cruchank, 1876, a white mob in Louisiana who had killed a large group of African Americans at a political rally, ruling the Supreme Court said that the 14th Amendment of equal protection and due process applied only to state actions, not to those of individuals. This further undermined the protection of individual citizens, especially African American. Democrats take back control. Republican rule was seen as an insult everywhere and they did not like that blacks were either in charge or standing up to their former masters. The KKK terrorized African Americans by night, burning homes, schools, and churches. The Klan had also beat, maim, and killed African Americans, carpetbaggers, and scallywags. Klan violence, along with the Supreme Court rulings, would help Southern Democrats regain power. Tax and spend Republicans using high taxes Radical Republicans and national corruption, Democrats seized the opportunity to discredit black politicians. The Redeemers were wealthy white Southern men returned as governors of their states of Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina, and former Confederate leaders returned to the Congress. The end of Reconstruction, the election of 1876. In 1876, the Republicans nominated Rutherford B. Hayes for president and the Democrats nominated Samuel Tilden. Although Tilden won the popular vote, Republicans claimed fraud in three of the Republican-controlled southern states of Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida. The dispute in Oregon was settled very quickly in favor of Hayes.
Daniel Sickles found a glimmer of hope. He was Hayes' campaign manager. Hayes could win if the Pacific Soap, which returns were not in, went for him, and if the Republicans retained control of South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. Over Chandler's signature, he telegraphed the following audacious message to leading Republicans in South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida, and Oregon. With your state, sure for Hayes, he is elected. Hold your state. By about 6 a.m., he had received encouraging answers from South Carolina and Oregon. Before going home to bed, Sickles again telegraphed all four states, informing them that the enemy claimed each of them and enjoying vigilance and diligence. The Compromise of 1877. A 15-man commission would meet at the Wormley Hotel in Washington, D.C. and formulate the Compromise of 1877 several weeks before the presidential inauguration in March. A secret deal with Democrats, known as the Compromise of 1877, was later revealed. They had agreed that they would go along with Hayes as president. Hayes only promised to serve for one term. Also, Hayes had to withdraw every federal troop from the South, and the South would receive subsidies for building railroads. This singled the effective end of Reconstruction that had already been coming solely to an end. The end. Hayes honored the Compromise of 1877 and removed the remaining federal soldiers from the South. These soldiers were the ones who were protecting African Americans and white Republicans and their rights. And these areas of Republican governments that existed would soon fall. As Reconstruction ended, Southerners were more openly romanticized and the Confederates asserting the Civil War had been a war of Northern aggression. This lost cause narrative became very popular among Southern Democrats. Reconstruction significance. For African Americans, a few Southern blacks owned their farm. They did reunite with their families. Literacy did increase and provided hope for inclusion for all African Americans. For women, they were not given the right to vote, although a major part of the abolitionist movement they were a part of. The American Women's Suffrage Association would be formed. In state and national policies, Republicans are shunned in the South by whites and embraced by African Americans and would become the party of big business. Democrats would dominate the South and be identified with laborers. On state and federal power, voters wanted a balance of power between the two kinds. Most in Congress felt the South should be let alone to govern without federal interference. Although Reconstruction collapse and traditional forms of discrimination return with even greater force, the period did have its enduring legacies. Most notably, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments had come out of Reconstruction. Thanks to these amendments, African Americans now had equal rights, and the federal government would be more responsible for playing a role in ensuring those rights. And so ends our study of Reconstruction.